Hello and welcome to our next lecture of CHY 113. I realized something that I, I really need a new way to introduce the lectures rather than just saying welcome to the lecture. And so I want you guys to all help with that. Uh, I, if you want, and we'll see who's paying attention here, email me your ideas for a different way that I can intro things and get things started. And I will pick the five best that I like and begin to add those into the rotation, so to speak, of how I introduce lectures. And if I choose yours, if you're one of the five, I will give you five extra credit points on the next exam. So there we go. Uh, another, it's just one way to earn some, some extra credit a little bit. And uh, yeah, so that would be great if you, if you guys could help me out with that. But anyway, let's go ahead and begin today. And so if you remember I, last time, we began a discussion of how electrons are arranged around the nucleus. And this was one of the, the big takeaways right here was this slide of the Bohr model and, and our shells around the nucleus. And so let's just recap just a little bit of how we got there and, and how and some of the, the work that Bohr did and some of the insights that, that we had that, that helped lead Bohr to this conclusion. We talked a lot about the light equations. So remember our basic light equations, C equals wavelength times frequency, where C equals our speed of light, which is a universal constant. It means it is the same no matter what, anywhere you are in the universe, the speed of light in a vacuum will always be three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Lambda our wavelength, when you're doing these uh, speed of light calculations or the, the light equations in general, well, wavelength has to be in meters. Then our frequency, remember our units for frequency are hertz, which is the same as one over seconds or seconds minus one. And remember, that's just the, uh, the number of full wave cycles that a wave will go through every second. So sometimes frequency is referred to even as cycles per second. And so using our light equation here, we can relate the wavelength and the frequency. So we could use this to solve for either one. If we're given the frequency of a wave and we want to solve for wavelength, then we're just going to rewrite this for wavelength, put C over our frequency, and vice versa. If we know the wavelength and we want to find the frequency, we're going to solve for the frequency. Easy as that. We also looked at how we can relate energy into this with Planck's equation, E equals H times frequency, where H is Planck's constant, and that's equal to 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th. And the units on Planck's constant are meter squared, sorry, kilograms per second. And don't really worry too much, sorry about that, don't worry, don't worry about those units. Uh, they're not something that we're really going to use a lot, but we do like to always keep our units on everything. And so with Planck's equation, what we can do then is if we know the energy of a wave, or sorry, if we know the frequency of a wave, we can find the energy of that wave. And there are several ways to go about this. Uh, if we're just given the frequency, we just plug it right into the equation. If we're given the wavelength, then we, we can go a couple different ways. We can either simply use our light equations, solve for the frequency, and then plug it in. We could also rewrite our energy equation. Since we know frequency equals C over lambda, if we want, we can simply substitute in C over lambda for the frequency here. And we get E equals H times C all over lambda. And so that would just be doing the equation in one step if we wanted to. When we use our energy equation, what we're actually finding there, and this is important to note, what we're finding is the energy of one photon of light. So remember, we talked about how light can be viewed as either a particle or a wave. And so if we're thinking about light in terms of particles, we call them photons. And so 
when we find the energy using this equation, we're finding the energy just of one single photon, one single particle of light. And so as you would expect, those numbers are going to be very small, which you would also anticipate just from the fact that Planck's constant is times 10 to the negative 34. And so don't be surprised by that. You may also run into some questions occasionally where you want to find the energy perhaps of an entire mole of photons. Okay, so then you would use this equation, use Planck's equation to calculate the energy, and then multiply that by Avogadro's number to scale it up to a mole. So we spent a little bit of time with these, with, with looking at our light equations. We also talked a little bit about Rydberg's constant, or sorry, Rydberg's, the Rydberg equation, which uses Rydberg's constant. What, the, what Rydberg's equation does is it gives us the ability to calculate the wavelength of energy if an electron drops in energy level. So if we have an electron that was perhaps excited up to maybe our fourth energy level. So we have an electron that, that, that was sitting up here. Maybe it was originally on our second energy level here. And then it was given enough energy to excite it up to the fourth energy level. Almost immediately, it's going to drop back down to that second energy level. When it does so, it's going to release some energy. When it drops back down to that second energy level, it will release energy. The Rydberg equation gives us a way to calculate the wavelength of that energy that's being released. And so let's look at an example of that. Let's look, look in fact, at the one that, that I just talked about. So we're going to be dropping from the fourth to the second energy level. And so we'll take a look at what that calculation looks like. And so the Rydberg equation is one over the wavelength, the inverse of the wavelength equals R, the Rydberg constant, times one over N F squared, that's the energy level that we finally land on, minus one over N initial squared, that's the energy level that we start from. And so then we can just plug these in. So one over our wavelength is going to equal the Rydberg constant, which is 1.09678 times 10 to the seventh inverse meters. And we said that we're gonna drop from the fourth energy level. So four squared, sorry, our final energy level, we're dropping down to the second. We have to be careful with those. And I almost messed it up myself. So you can see how easy it is to make mistakes here. You just have to think about it and, and make sure that you're being very deliberate. So we're dropping down to the second energy level from the fourth energy level. And so then we finally plug that into the calculator. I should have done this calculation ahead of time, so bear with me. Six. And so remember, that's the inverse of our wavelength that we get from this. And so then we want to do just one over this answer in order to get to wavelength. And so one over 2.056 times 10 to the sixth gives us a wavelength of 4.86 times 10 to the negative seventh meters. And remember that we often like to report wavelengths in nanometers, especially when we're talking about light. So we can convert this to nanometers if we want. 486 nanometers. And so an energy transition of an electron dropping from the fourth energy level down to the second energy level will release energy equivalent to 486 nanometers. Now remember back even further when we looked at the hydrogen spectra in the last lecture, this 486 nanometers, this is the purple line that we see in that spectra. And so we're able to actually calculate the, the wavelength of those lines that we see. And so that's the using the Rydberg equation. So we went even further from that in, in looking beyond just the shells. Uh, and remember actually when we were looking at our, 
quantum numbers we introduced n which is our principal quantum number or we can think of that just as our Bohr shells. N tells us what Bohr shell are we on, as we can see here. We took that a step further and identified our second principal quantum number, L, which gives us our sublevels. If L was equal to 1, that was an S sublevel. L equal to 2, that's a P sublevel. L, sorry, I keep doing this. I did this yesterday as well when I was putting something together. L equals zero. I don't know why I keep making that mistake. Is an S sublevel. L equals one is a P sublevel. L equals two is a D sublevel. And finally, L equals three is what we call an F type sublevel. The different sublevels can hold a differing number of electrons. S sublevels can hold two electrons. P sublevels hold six electrons. D sublevels hold 10 electrons. And F sublevels hold 14 electrons. And we can see that depicted here. So here we have our second Bohr shell. The second Bohr, or sorry, our first Bohr shell. Our first Bohr shell only has an S sublevel. And so there's the two electrons in the first Bohr shell are in the S sublevel. Our second Bohr shell has an S and a P sublevel. The S sublevel holds two electrons. The P sublevel holds six for a total of eight, which is the maximum that the second Bohr shell can hold. And so on. We add in the third sublevel, a D sublevel in the third Bohr shell. So the third Bohr shell has S, P, and D. The D sublevel holds 10, six in P two in S for a total of 18 electrons, maximum in our third Bohr shell, which is the maximum the third Bohr shell can hold. And then finally, we add in the F sublevel in the fourth Bohr shell, 14, 10, six, and two for a total of 32 electrons in each sublevel, which is the maximum that the fourth Bohr shell can hold. And so that's where we, we sort of left things yesterday, was looking at our, our a principal quantum number, our Bohr shell that we're in, and then we refine that down further to looking at the different sublevels. We used a, a, an address analogy and sort of thinking that the first Bohr shell might tell you the town somebody lives in, or the, the principal quantum number, rather, N, tells you the town that somebody might live in, whereas L, the sublevel, narrows that down a little further, might tell you the street that somebody lives on. We're now going to start narrowing things down even further and going on to what we call the M sublevel, sometimes the M sub L. This has different names. We're going to refer to it as the orientation in space sublevel. What we're going to do now is take each of the sublevels and break those down even further. into what we call orbitals. And there are two electrons in each orbital. Using our address analogy, now when we get to this orientation in space and when we get to these orbitals, now we're going from the street to an individual house where somebody would live. And so there are two electrons in each orbital. And so let's break down what that means for just a second. If we're talking about L being equal to zero, that's an S sublevel, two electrons max in an S sublevel, that means there's one orbital in an S sublevel. Two electrons fit in each orbital. S only hold, holds two electrons, so it only needs one orbital to house those electrons. If L equals one in a P sublevel, we have six electrons that can fit in a P sublevel. Two electrons fit into each orbital. That means a P sublevel consists of three 
separate orbitals and so on. In our D sublevel, which can house 10 electrons total, means we must have five orbitals in our D sublevel. In our F sublevels, must hold seven total orbitals. And so again, to keep in mind where we're at, we're taking our sublevels and we're breaking those sublevels now down into individual orbitals, which is the actual area that an electron will occupy. Each orbital holds two electrons, which leads us to a differing number of orbitals per sublevel. And so let's talk about why we call this the orientation in space quantum number. If we think about our s orbital, so like I said, there's only going to be one orbital in an s sublevel, and that's when it has to have a shape of a sphere. We're not going to worry too much about these shapes just right just yet. Just sort of trust me on this that, that an s orbital will have a spherical shape. And there's only one orbital, one s orbital per sublevel. For our p sublevel, we said there are going to be three different orbitals. Let's keep in mind some of the nature of electrons. Electrons want to be ideally as close to the nucleus as they can. But we also know that electrons repel each other. So if we have six electrons that are all in a p sublevel, then they're all as close to the nucleus as they can be, but they still want to separate as much as they can from each other because they, they're going to repel. So they don't want to be right next to each other. And so occupying these different areas in space in these different orbitals is how they're going to do that. And so we can envision one of these orbitals and the p orbitals are dumbbell shaped as you see here. We can picture that one of these orbitals is along maybe an x-axis. Picture your, your typical x, y, z axis. So one of these orbitals is along an x-axis. One of these orbitals is going to be along a y-axis like this. The other orbital, tilt this a little bit so you can see the three dimensions maybe, the other orbital is going to be along a z-axis. And so we have these three different p orbitals that are all along a different axis. They're all in a different orientation in space. And that's how the electrons are going to separate from each other. And likewise with our d orbitals, the shapes just start to get more complicated at this point. And so just know with a d orbital that we have these four different clover shapes for the actual shapes of the orbitals and this one weird little dumbbell with a ring around it shape. Don't worry about where these come from, but you do want to know what these different shapes are. And note as well that each of these take up a different area in space. We have one that's along the yz axis, one along xy, one along xz, and then don't really worry about this the xy and z squared and the d and the z squared. And don't really worry about those. Just note the fact that they are each along, that they each are in different areas in space. And so that's quantum number L. It starts to tell us our, our orientation in space. Let's start to look at what we call the, the allowable numbers for each quantum number. So let's actually come over to our whiteboard here. We're going to be looking at the allowable numbers for our quantum numbers. So n, our principal quantum number, can be integer values, one, two, three, four, five, and so on, theoretically up to infinity. The reality is that we've only found atoms in their natural state with maximum L values of seven. Those are the largest that we found. And you can see that here in the periodic table, in fact. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's one of the ways the periodic table is arranged is in each, in each period, the period number is equal to the n value of the outermost electrons. And so potassium, right here in our fourth period, the outermost electrons are in n equals four, so on. 
are allowable numbers for L, L can be anything from zero up through N minus one. What this really means is that when we're looking at allowable numbers for L, we do so within the context of various N values. And so in other words, when N equals one, the only value that L could possibly be is zero, which remember corresponds to an S sublevel. This means that the only sublevel that can exist in the first Bohr shell in N equals one is an S sublevel, like we've talked about. When N equals two, our second Bohr shell, now L can still be zero, as we can see here, L can be anything from zero up through n minus one. So when n, when n is equal to two, two minus one is one. So L could be zero for an S sublevel, but L could also be one for a P sublevel. So this just means that within n equals two, we have an S and a P sublevel. Again, like we've talked about and seen and so forth. When n equals three, that means L could equal zero for our S sublevel. It could equal one for our P sublevel, or now within N equals three, we could have our D sublevel. When N equals four, L could be zero for our S sublevel, one for our P sublevel, two for our D sublevel, or now finally L could be three for our F sublevel. We could go on, theoretically, the G sublevel exists, the H sublevel exists. Um, the reality for reasons that we're, we're not really going to get too, too much in here is that those sublevels, electrons really don't occupy those uh, unless they're in a very excited state. Um, really for, for all practical limits, we go to the F sublevel and that's it. Uh, and again, for reasons that, that go beyond what we're going to explore in this course. And so those are our allowable numbers for N and L. Let's look at our allowable numbers now for M or M sub L. Our allowable numbers are anything, are integer values from negative L up through positive L. Now, again, what we're doing when we look at our allowable numbers for M is we're looking at those within the context of various L values. For instance, let's take a look at L equals one. So our P sublevel, we said that M could equal anything from negative L, could equal integer values from negative L to positive L. That means when N, sorry, when L equals one, M could equal negative one, zero, or positive one. The actual value of these numbers doesn't really matter. What we want to focus in on, what we want to pay attention to, is how many of those possibilities exist. When L is equal to one, we have three possible M values. One, two, three. That corresponds to the three different orbitals we said could exist within a P sublevel. Likewise, when L equals two, our D sublevels. Now M could equal negative two, negative one, zero, positive one, or positive two. The important factor here is how many of these values there are. There are five different possible M values when L equals two. One, two, three, four, five different possible D orbitals. And we would see the same if we, if we explored L equals three for our F sublevels, there would be seven possible values of L, or sorry, of M corresponding to the seven possible F orbitals. So that's really the importance of quantum number M sub L, is that it, it, it tells us how many possible orbitals there are. The other thing that we start to use M sub L for is electron comparisons. Let's say, for instance, I'm looking at two different electrons within the same atom. And so in electron one, N equals two, we'll say that L equals one, so we're in a P sublevel. 
and m equals negative one. You know, we don't really attach meaning to that negative one other than to say it's in one of the particular orbitals. For our second electron, n also equals two, l, l also equals one. So what we know so far is that we're talking about two different electrons, both in the second Bohr shell, and they're both in a P sublevel. But for this particular electron, M is going to equal positive one. All that this tells us is that we have different M values, which means that these two electrons are in two different orbitals. One of them might be in this orbital, and one of them might be in this orbital. So they're differing they're, they're both in, the, in P sublevels in the second Bohr shell, but they're occupying different orbitals. So that's important. And so this just goes over some of the allowable numbers like we just talked about. This also is more allowable numbers. So we've talked about some of this. Sorry, I'm just I'm moving on a bit because we've talked about a lot of this already. So it turns out though that a set of four quantum numbers actually describes an electron. We need a fourth quantum number still to, to establish some of our behavior of electrons. Because let's say for instance, instead of differing M values, let's say we're talking about two electrons in the same Bohr shell, in the same sublevel, in the same orbital. It turns out that there's something called the Pauli exclusion principle which tells us that no two electrons in the same atom can have the same set of four quantum numbers. So there must be another quantum number here that, that helps define the behavior of electrons. And that's going to be quantum number S, sometimes M sub S. S corresponds to the spin of an electron. So as, as two electrons are in orbitals, they spin as well. They spin along their own axis two electrons within the same orbital will spin in opposite directions. And we denote that spin as either plus or minus one half. And so this is the, the final aspect of sort of electron location and electron behavior that we look at with quantum numbers is the direction of that spin. By definition, we call the positive one half a spin up and negative one half is spin down. Don't think of these as, as like clockwise or counterclockwise or anything like that. Just note that that when we're talking spin up or spin down plus a half or minus a half, we're talking about opposite directly rotation. They're spinning in opposite directions from each other. That's all that means. And so that's our fourth quantum number. And so again, sort of think of it like an address where N will tell you the town somebody lives in, L narrows it down to the street, M narrows it down to an individual house, S can start to describe maybe the, the behavior within a room, so to speak, is somebody spinning around as, as they sit in their room. And like I mentioned, no, Two quantum numbers can have, no two electrons in an atom can have the same set of quantum numbers. That's the Pauli exclusion principle. And this slide here just recaps and, and summarizes everything that, that we've been talking about. So take some time with this if you want. Uh, this is the same thing that I've been showing on the whiteboard with my lectures, lecture here, same stuff we've been talking about, but feel free to pause the video here and really take this in if you'd like and make sure that this really starts to make sense for you. We've discussed allowable quantum numbers already, but this is the same thing that we've talked about. N could be integer values, integer values, one, two, three, and so on. L is anything from zero up to N minus one. So we talked about these. M is anything from negative L to positive L. And so it is important to note as well that when we talk about the these sublevels, or when we talk about, especially like about the shapes of these sublevels, 
we had mentioned briefly, or I had mentioned briefly in the last lecture, that when we're talking about the, the location of electrons and so on, really we're, we're talking more in terms of probabilities. And so there's this big long equation called the Schrodinger equation. It has lots of big fancy terms in it. It's a real complicated equation that we're certainly not using in here. But the Schrodinger equation and, and the use of the Schrodinger equation gives rise to these orbital shapes. When we put in all of the information, for instance, about the energy regarding a 2s sublevel, the Schrodinger equation gives out this probability that a 2s electron would be found somewhere within this sphere. Likewise, that a 3p sublevel or an electron in a 3p would be found somewhere within the sort of dumbbell shape. And so that is just important to note and to remember that anytime we're talking about electrons and their locations, we're not really talking about exact precise locations to say it is definitely right here somewhere. We're talking about a region of probability to say that it's somewhere within this, this region. Think of it like a fan. If you've got a big fan that's blowing, at any point, you can say within the radius of that fan that, okay, most likely the fan blade is somewhere within that big spinning disk. You don't know exactly where, but it's somewhere within there. It's kind of the same idea here. And again, just sort of our, our shapes of some of the various orbitals. I'm going to go through these fairly quickly. We're not going to worry a lot about this information. It, it sort of is, is the same stuff that I've been talking about with our shapes of, of some of the different orbitals. Uh, but feel free to pause the video if you'd like to really investigate these or go back and look at the slides and, and really take a look at the information with some of these shapes. Talked about this already, our fourth quantum number, m sub s, being our spin, plus a half and minus a half. And that is our fourth and final quantum number. Trying to decide if I really want to go into this diamagnetic versus paramagnetic, um, and we won't. We'll we'll wait and go into that a little bit in our next lecture. And so this slide just provides us with a review of all of the quantum numbers. So go ahead and take some time to to, to look through this and make sure that this is making sense with everything that we've talked about with quantum numbers so far. And this is our last slide in this lecture before we now go on to talk about something we call electron configurations. So let's bring this slideshow up now. Get myself arranged here a little bit with my views. And there we go. And so we talked about how electrons are arranged in, in the various Bohr shells. Within those Bohr shells, there are sublevels that exist. Within those sublevels, the electrons exist in orbitals. And then the, the fourth, within those orbitals, electrons spin in opposite directions. And this just, um, just summarizes all of that information that we've been talking about. We're now going to start to look at what we call electron configurations, which is a depiction of where the electrons actually are located. And so when we're writing an electron configuration, let's say we want to write the electron configuration of our simplest atom, we're going to look at the electron configuration of hydrogen. The first thing that we write is a number which indicates the Bohr shell, which indicates the principal quantum number where that electron resides. And so we're going to start by writing just a one. It's our simplest atom, so it makes sense that the, the electron for hydrogen would exist just on the first Bohr shell. So we're going to write a one there. The next thing that we're going to write is the letter for the sublevel where that electron is. Now, if you remember what we talked about, is that the only sublevel which exists within the first Bohr shell is an S sublevel. And so we're going to write that in. So we're talking about an electron which exists on the first Bohr shell within an S sublevel. Lastly, we note how many electrons are in that sublevel by writing the number as a superscript. And so this tells us that, the, that for hydrogen, there is one electron in the S sublevel on the first Bohr shell. 
we read this as 1s1. When we get to different numbers here, if there's a 2 here, for instance, which we'll see quite a bit, we do not refer to that as squared. It is not a mathematical function. It is a counting number, how many electrons are there. So we would say 1s2 if this were a 2 there and so on. And so this is just for our simplest atom. This is just for hydrogen. We just have one electron in the 1s sublevel. So its electron configuration is 1s1. When we are completing electron configurations for more complicated atoms and larger atoms, the way to think of it, or one of the ways to think of it, is sort of picture the atom without any electrons at all. And what we're going to do is, so it's just the nucleus. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start to put the electrons in there. We're going to start to fill the electrons in. When we do that, the Aufbau principle tells us that we fill the lowest energy levels first. And so we're going to start by filling in 1s. Let's actually do one of these out. Let me shrink this down a little bit so but we can still see it. And so let's say we want to do the electron configuration for oxygen. We look on our periodic table and we see that oxygen has an atomic number of eight. That means that we have eight electrons in a neutral oxygen atom that we need to place in there. And so, like I said, we're going to envision the, the oxygen atom is just the nucleus, no electrons in there yet. We're going to start to put the electrons in. The first place we're going to put electrons is in our 1s orbital. And so, again, sort of, sort of build things up a little bit. We want to start with our lowest energy, which is the closest to the nucleus. So we're going to start by filling in the first four shell, four shell one. Four shell one only has an S sublevel. S sublevels can hold two electrons. Now that we've filled this S sublevel in the first Bohr shell, we have to move to our second Bohr shell because the first Bohr shell is filled. So we're going to move now to our second Bohr shell. The first sublevel we come to in the second Bohr shell is an S sublevel. S sublevels hold two electrons. Now that the S sublevel is full within the second Bohr shell, we're going to go to the p sublevel. Now, when we talk about how many electrons can fit in a sublevel, that's our maximum amount. We're not going to put more in there than the maximum, but we don't need to put up to the maximum if we don't need to. So let's sort of just count where we're at. Oxygen holds, or oxygen has eight electrons, but we've placed four of those. So we only have four more electrons to go. And so those four electrons are right here as 2p4. And so this then is our electron configuration for oxygen. And we followed the Aufbau principle, which tells us we're going to start in our lowest energy level and build up. Now we do notice when we're doing this, and we're gonna do several more examples and you're gonna do so many of these eventually that it's gonna make your eyes bleed. But one of the things that we notice as we build up, and I like this diagram because this really illustrates it for us, that, okay, first we fill 1s, then we fill 2s, then 2p, so far so good, then 3s and 3p, okay, great. This shows us that we actually fill 4s before we fill 3d. This is very important when we're doing configurations. The reasons for this aren't real important as far as the scope of our class. Let's suffice it to say that the D, that, that when we're looking at the Aufbau principle, we're looking at the, the inherent energy of sublevels, not necessarily how close they are to the nucleus. How close they are to the nucleus plays a big role, but the inherent just complexity of a D sublevel in comparison to an S sublevel means that the 4S sublevel is lower in energy than the 3D sublevel. What this means is that 4S will be filled before 3D. And we see that pattern throughout the, the table when we're filling out configurations. 
5S will be filled before 4D. 6S will be filled before 5D, and so on. It gets even more complicated, and we'll see this in a little in just in the next slide. It gets even more complicated when we get up to the F sublevel. We're actually going to fill 6S before we ever fill 4D. Or sorry, we're going to yeah 6S sorry before we ever fill 4F. So we're going to put electrons into into sublevel 6S then put them into 4F, and then come back and put them into 5D. Now, you're probably asking yourself, Mr. Staples, how the heck am I actually going to remember any of that? A few different ways. One is we have a handy little chart like this, in which we just follow the arrows, and it tells us what order we're going to fill our sublevels in. It, it gives us the alphabet principle, essentially. So we're going to start by filling 1s. We're going to start here. We're going to fill 1s. When 1s is filled, we're going to come back around and now fill 2s. When 2s is filled, we'll come back around and fill 2p, and then 3s. Then we'll come back around after 3s is filled. Then we'll fill 3p, and then 4s. Then we finally come back around and fill 3D. Sorry. 3D, then 4P, then 5S, then 4D, 5P, 6S, and then after 6S, 4P, 5D, 6P, 7s, and then finally way back around again, and so on. So we follow the arrows. When you get down to the end of one arrow, come back around and start onto the second. After that arrow, come back around and start onto the next, and so forth. And so when we're filling orbitals, when we're coming up with electron configurations, we sort of follow this pathway. We count up how many electrons we have to work with. And we follow this pathway until we've used all of those electrons. Let's look at a couple other examples using, using our pathway here. So let's look maybe at carbon. Carbon has six electrons. Again, we're just looking at a carbon atom, atomic number six. We use the periodic table, so we have six electrons we need to place. We're going to start here with one S. That's going to hold two electrons. We come back around to 2s. That's going to hold two electrons. Come back around to 2p. We only need to place two more electrons. And so that's it for carbon, 2p2. Let's look at, let's maybe do our electron configuration for magnesium. So magnesium, find on the periodic table, 12 electrons. Again, we're going to follow through our pathway. We're going to fill 1s. We're going to come back around. Our next arrow, fill 2s. Back around to our next arrow and fill 2p. Now we've used up 2, 4, 10, so we still have to put more electrons in. So we're going to come to 3s and put in our two electrons. Let's look at iron. We find iron on the periodic table right there with its 26 electrons. There we go, 26. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to start here with 1s. Come back around to 2s. Drop to our next arrow. 2p6, 3s2, we've only done 12. We still have 14 more electrons to go. So now we're going to come back around to the next arrow down, 3p, and then 4s following our arrows. And then after 4s, now we come back around to the next arrow. Now we start to put electrons into 3d. We do a count. 
2, 4, 10, 12, 16, sorry, 18, 20. So we've put in 20 electrons so far, six more to go. So those six right there. So the total electron configuration for iron, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d6. Tells us where all the electrons are in iron. And so we can use this, this path to fill in all of our electrons until we get up to the total that we have to fill. There's another way to look at this. Let's take a look at the periodic table and how the periodic table is set up. Because it turns out that one of the ways the periodic table is arranged is, is in a way that makes it easier for us to fill out configurations. We can look at these as blocks. We have what we call the S block, our alkali metals and our alkaline earth metals. And then helium over here is in the S block as well. Our P block, our non-metals and our big heavy metals. Our D block here, our transition metals. And then finally our F block, our lanthanides and our actinides. And so one of the ways that we can view this is we have hydrogen here, one electron, 1s1. Helium, 1s2. Now that we've filled 1s, we're going to start to fill 2s. Lithium here, 2s1. Beryllium, 2s2. Boron, 1s2, 2s2, 2p1, and so forth. We just have to note that because of the, the energy level thing that we talked about earlier, that 3D comes after 4S. And so when we're, when we're working on electron configurations, this gives us another tool that we can use. What we can do is simply look at where, a, an, uh, where an atom is within the periodic table. That will tell us what its electron configuration must end with. So for instance, right here, if we are talking about, and I have to remind myself what element that is, or if we're talking about chlorine, chlorine sits right here in the periodic table. And so it sits one, two, three rows down. I have no idea why I wrote an E, chlorine. It sits three rows down. It's in our P block. Sorry, I've been writing this and you haven't been able to see me. There we go, chlorine. So again, sits one, two, three rows down. So there's my three. Chlorine's in the P block of the periodic table. So three P. Chlorine sits one, two, three, four, five elements over within the P block. And so I know that the electron configuration for chlorine must end with 3P5. Then I can just build it up from there and just stop when I get there. 1S2, 2S2, 2P6, 3S2, 3P5. And there's my configuration for chlorine. Let's give it a check. Chlorine's atomic number is 17, so I have 17 electrons. Sure enough, 2, 4, 10, 12, 17. And so that placement in the periodic table and looking at these, these blocks of elements give us another great way to look at, the, at how we fill the electron configurations. And so when you're looking at how to fill out the actual orbor, or uh, fill out the orbitals within order, you can memorize this pattern, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p6, 5s2, so on. That's a little bit harder. Or you can use the periodic table, which is a lot easier. Now, that being said, I will let you know that you're going to do enough of these that you're eventually going to pretty much have the order memorized. You're, it's just going to roll off your tongue. You're just going to be able to sit there and go 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p6, 5s2, and so on. You're, you're going to do enough of them that, that it's just going to sort of roll through. But it's going to take some practice to get there. It's going to take a fair bit of work to, uh, to get to that point. 
So electron configurations provide us, if we're thinking back to quantum numbers, electron configurations will provide us information about N and L and, and how many electrons reside in there. And so for instance, let's go back to our, sorry, let's go back to our chlorine. And so if we, if we look at our last entry perhaps in chlorine, so there was our last entry, this tells us that our outermost electrons are in N equals three. Our outermost electrons are in the third Bohr shell. They're in a P sublevel, which also tells us that for these outermost electrons, L is equal to one. And so the electron configurations give us information about quantum numbers N and L. We can go even further than that with what we call box diagrams that will provide us further orbital information about quantum numbers M and S as well. When we're looking at orbital filling diagrams, we now have to take into account not only the Alphal principle, which tells us that our lower energy levels are going to fill first, but we have to take into account Hund's rule, which tells us that the that degenerate orbitals, which are simply orbitals of the same energy, for instance, 3p, remember there are three orbitals within a p sublevel. So if I'm talking about those three, 3p orbitals, they're all the same energy that we would call those 3p orbitals degenerate to each other. And so degenerate orbitals fill with electrons until they're half filled before pairing up. In other words, if I'm putting three electrons into the p sublevel, each of those electrons will go into a different p orbital first. It's only when I add in a fourth electron to that p sublevel will the electrons start to pair up within the orbitals. And we'll see what that looks like in just a second. We also have to take into account what we call the Pauli exclusion principle, which remember tells us that no two electrons in an atom can have the same quantum numbers. This means that we somehow have to depict the two electrons that are doubled up, that are in the same orbital, are going to have two different spins from each other. So see what that looks like. And so here we have, for instance, electron, three electrons filling our 2p sublevel. So this would be the electron, maybe the, the end of the electron configuration for nitrogen. And so nitrogen, atomic number seven, so I have seven electrons to look at. So I do my configuration, I get 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. And so I'm looking at these three electrons right here. Sorry, there we go. That's better. So those three electrons that are going into the into the 2p sublevel, I now separate out those orbitals. And so this 2p sublevel, I'm going to break down into the individual three orbitals that we said exist within the p sublevel. And so these are the three different orbitals. Remember that dumbbell shape. Let's bring this actually back to here for just a second. Let's see if I can find. Come back through this as quick as I can. There we go. So what I'm, all I'm doing here, oh, you're messing with me, PowerPoint. All I'm doing here is I'm breaking out this P sublevel right here. I'm breaking out into these three different orbitals. That's what these lines represent. These are called box diagrams because sometimes instead of lines, I'll draw some crude boxes instead. Uh, sometimes we draw them as boxes, but same thing. And so these three boxes or the three lines, because my boxes are messy, so I'm gonna make those disappear. These three lines just represent the three different P orbitals within the P sublevel. And so now we have three electrons that we're going to put in there. And so the Hun, what Hun's rule tells us is that we do not fill those electrons like this. We use arrows to represent our spin, spin up, positive a half, spin down for negative a half, 
Hun's rule tells us that this is incorrect. Hun's rule tells us that we individually fill the orbitals before we start to pair them up. So those three electrons are going to exist in separately in the three different orbitals. It's only when we start to have more electrons in there will we begin to double them up, such as when we have six, if we're looking, for instance, at neon instead of nitrogen. Now with neon, we have filled up our P. So neon will end with two P6, and that's what we're showing on this slide. Now we've doubled up the electrons within the orbitals. Arrows going down to signify negative a half or spin down. And so let's just look at a few other examples of that. So again, here we have nitrogen that we've looked at. Atomic number seven, so seven electrons. 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. Here's 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. Just going to go through these. We've talked about all of these rules already. We're just going to look at a few more examples now. Here's lithium, three electrons, 1s2, 2s1. And over here, we see sometimes that, that we write these as well in, in increasing energy. So energy would be going up our axis here, 1s2 being the lowest in energy, and then 2s1. Beryllium. Four electrons, 1s2, 2s2, and so forth. Boron, five electrons. So now we're going to start to fill our 2p sublevel, 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. Carbon, 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. Note that those electrons within 2p are in two different orbitals. Nitrogen, we've looked at. Now oxygen, now we get 1s2, 2s2, 2p4, 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. Now we've begun to double up. In order to make sure that you're satisfying Hun's rule, what I would recommend when you're writing out box diagrams even if you know you're going to be doubling up, fill them one at a time. In other words, if I'm writing out my box diagram for oxygen, and so oxygen, like we said, eight electrons, I do the electron configuration, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. So I'm gonna write them all out, 1s2, 2s2. So again, here's my 1s, here's my 2s, here's my 2p. So I'm gonna first fill my 1s, then my 2s, sorry, not 2p6. Hopefully somebody caught my mistake there. <laughs> 2p4, there we go. When I'm filling in my arrows here, what I do, even though I know I'm going to eventually double up because I have four, in order to, to just make sure that I'm keeping myself in the habit and, and to get into the habit of doing this, I always fill like this. Go, I go one, two, three, and then four. I do the same thing if I'm doing something like fluorine. And so fluorine, and you can see it here, but I'll just I'll still write it out. Fluorine with its nine electrons. 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. So 1s2, 2s2, and then I go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I even quite often do this if I know it's completely filled. If it's something like neon, I will quite often do the same thing. And so neon, I'll keep it in red because it's fancy, with its 10 electrons, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. 
So I get my 1s2, 2s2, and then I will quite often still go through singly and then back through to fill them up. It just gets you into the habit. So you know if you're always doing that, you're always going to be obeying Hun's rule. Another thing to note, I thought I had it on this slide, but I don't, um, is that sometimes, and it just depends on, on what resource you're looking at, and so don't let this throw you. Sometimes, and, and I might do it too, depending on what my mindset is, sometimes you might see half arrows written. You might see them, you might see them written like this. It's the same exact thing. It's just, it, it, and it means the same thing. So don't let that throw you off. We, we just sometimes write half arrows instead of a full arrow for our electrons. And so this is just an example with aluminum. So now we've got a 2s2, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p1. So now we're going on into the third period. Let's, let's, let's look at another big example here. Let's, let's, let's look at what we call the noble gas shortcut. So let's take a look at the, the electron configurations of a few different elements. We're gonna look at our electron configuration for neon. Then we're going to look at our configurations for sodium, magnesium. I keep having to turn around and look at my periodic table. Aluminum and silicone. And so I'd pause the video now if I were you and just do these configurations, write these configurations, but try to do them as orderly and as, and as neat as you can so that things are lining up with each other. So that your 1s's line up and your 2s's line up and so forth down the line. So pause the video now and write out these configurations like that. In fact, I'll pause too and just write them out so that they're going to just magically appear in just a second. Boom, told you, just like magic, there they are. So hopefully you came up with these same electron configurations. Let's go ahead and check and, and, and be sure if you did not come up with these, start, uh, you know, pause the video now and make sure that you, can, that you know where these electron configurations are coming from. So let's take a look at these. So these are the configurations for neon through silicone. What do you notice that's similar in all of these? Hopefully what you see is that all of these configurations share this in common. They share 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. In other words, sodium, magnesium, aluminum, and silicone all start with the exact same configuration that neon has. We can use this to develop a shortcut method for electron configurations. Instead of writing 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, what I can write is neon in brackets. That stands now for 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. So if I'm writing out the configuration for sodium, instead of writing out the whole thing, I can just write neon in brackets and then write what comes after it. Just write the 3s1. If I'm doing my configuration for aluminum, I can write neon in brackets. That takes the place of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. And then I can just do 3s2, 3p1. That is our noble gas notation. And so here we see the configuration for silicone. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p2. My electron configuration for it. Neon, ah, uh, sorry. Neon in brackets, 3s2, there's a typo, 3p2. Let me fix that right now. That's gonna bother me. There we go. I'm finding so many typos with, with you guys this semester that I ha had never seen before. And I've been using some of these slides for several years. There we go. So there's our noble gas notation for the electron configuration of silicon. Neon, 3s2, 3p2. And we can do the same thing with our box notation, our orbital notation. Neon, and then just 3s2, 3p2. Again, note that we're using Hund's rule, occupying electrons singly before we double them up. 
And so this next slide, I know you, you can't see it, but if you open up a slideshow the, separately, just again, going to remember the unit three materials page, you can see the slideshow. Uh, and this just provides us with the ground state electron configurations of pretty much every, um, every element there is. Uh, and so take a peek at this when you get some time. As we noted before, all when we start to get to our transition metals, we have a little bit of a, of a hiccup in our, um, in our arrangement where we fill 3D after 4S and so on. And so if we are doing the, uh, a noble gas shortcut of a transition metal, we're just going to take that into account. And so let's actually back up and look at some other noble gas examples real quick. If we're doing our configuration, perhaps our electron configuration of calcium, we want to do the noble gas shortcut of that. We find the noble gas that comes before calcium, calcium right here on our periodic table, the noble gas that comes before calcium is argon. And so we're going to just write argon in brackets. And remember that that stands for the, the entire configuration up to that point. So that stands for 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. So the only thing that I have left is 4s2 for calcium. And so there's my noble gas shortcut my noble gas notation for the electron configuration of calcium. Let's look at iron. Same thing, iron's right here in our periodic table. The noble gas that comes before iron again is argon. And we can use our periodic table to see that after argon, just like we just did, we're gonna fill 4S2. And then to get to iron, 3D, now we're filling 3D, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 3D, 6. And we could do that anywhere. We could do that if we wanted to. Oh, we'll get really fancy. Let's maybe do the noble gas configuration for rhenium, RE. So our noble gas that comes before rhenium, I lost it, here it is. The noble gas before rhenium is xenon, Xe. And so then after Xe, we're going to come down here and fill 6s. Now this is where, and we haven't really mentioned this yet, it's right here after 6s. When you see breaks like this, this is where the lanthanides and actinides are now taken out. So after 6s, that's when 4F is filled. And so after 6S, we're going to fill 4F14, and then come back around and fill 5D, one, two, three, four, in order to get to rhenium. And there's our noble gas notation for rhenium. We're not going to do too many that will be this big. I'm not going to throw the Fs at you, certainly on exams. Uh, you might have some Fs that you have to look at for your homework when you've got a little bit more time to, to really study the periodic table and look at the patterns. Um, but I won't give you anything this big on a test. I'll, I'll stick with above the, um, the lanthanides and the actinides, above the F block. And these are just some, some examples of everything from calcium through zinc, our transition metals in the fourth period. All of these in here. And so let's just look at, let's just sort of back up and look at where we're at. So some questions that I want you to ask yourself and answer, which orbitals are not allowed? Which orbitals could not exist? So take a look at these, figure out which orbital is, is not possible. And then also figure out which orbital is highest in energy out of those same ones. So which one would be filled last? But also then out of those, which one would be filled first? I thought I gave the answers. Oh, I did. Okay. So back up. Let me back up. So there we go. Pause the video now. <laughs> 
hopefully you didn't just see the answer to the first one that I slapped up there. But go ahead and pause the video, answer these questions, restart, and see if you got the right answers. 2D is not allowed. The D sublevel does not exist in the second Bohr shell. Highest in energy is 4F out of all of these. Lowest in energy is 3P, because remember 2D doesn't actually exist. So our lowest in energy out of these will be 3D. And then another couple of questions. How many unpaired electrons exist in the ground state configuration of selenium? So for this, you'll need to do the orbital box diagram to see how many single electrons there are. And then also just answer the maximum number of electrons that can be in an F sublevel. Pause the video and answer these. Hopefully you came up with two electrons, two unpaired electrons in the ground state configuration of selenium and 14 F sublevels, 14 F electrons, sorry. And then just a few more. Write out the complete electron configuration for phosphorus, not the orbital, not the noble gas shortcut. Fill out the actual complete configuration. Also look at the complete orbital box notation for fluorine. And then finally, the noble gas configuration, the noble gas notation for arsenic. So same, same deal, pause the video. Hopefully you came up with these answers. Let's take a few minutes and look at the electron configuration of ions. If you're doing the electron configuration of an anion, we simply add the appropriate number of electrons, sorry, uh, and then add that into our total. So for instance, the electron configuration for oxygen two minus, for our oxide anion. Oxygen atoms have eight electrons. So O2 minus will have 10 electrons. And so our electron configuration would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Easy enough. For cations, same basic idea. We're going to remove electrons from our electron total. And so for instance, Magnesium, the electron configuration for a magnesium atom, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2. Magnesium, remember, will form a 2 plus ion. And so we're going to remove our last electrons from the highest principal quantum number. Our highest principal quantum number for magnesium is 3. So we're going to remove these 3s electrons. So a magnesium 2 plus ion will be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Let's look at what happens when we have transition metals though. So our rule for finding the, the electron configuration for cations is that we remove electrons from the orbital with the highest principal quantum number. That is not necessarily the last orbital that we put electrons in. In an iron atom, the last atom that we put electrons in is our D, or the last orbital is our 3D orbital here. But we're going to remove electrons from the orbital with the highest principal quantum number. That's right here, this 4S. So the iron two plus ion I thought I actually gave it, but maybe, there it is. Sorry, I'm not sure what happened with my slides there. This is what that is going to look like. We've taken out these 4s2 electrons here. So the iron two plus ion configuration will look like this. And so that we're going to see that within the transition metals, that we're going to remove those S electrons because they're in the outermost principal quantum number. And how do we know this happens? Because of some magnetic principles. It turns out that ions with unpaired electrons are what we call paramagnetic. They're attracted to a magnetic field. Ions without unpaired electrons are diamagnetic. They're not attracted to a magnetic field. Fe3 plus have five unpaired electrons. That makes Fe3 plus, that makes something like iron oxide, 
paramagnetic, attracted to a magnetic field. Let's take a look at that. And so Fe3 plus, and so the normal configuration for Fe, as we talked about, is going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d6. Let's just focus on, on the end of this. And so, sorry, yeah, we'll, we'll look at the noble gas shortcut. And so iron uh, is going to be argon, then 4s2, 3d6. And so the iron atom will have a configuration that looks like this. Now, we know that that iron is magnetic and again we know that that ions with unpaired electrons are going to be magnetic so this tells us that when we form iron three plus we're going to lose those two s electrons first then we're going to lose one of those d electrons because so we have to lose three total right So that's what the configuration for iron three plus would look like. Now this S sublevel is empty. And we have all these unpaired electrons here, making iron three plus paramagnetic, attracted to a magnetic field. It's just a little aside. And so you probably don't have a neighbor uh, sitting with you looking at this lecture, but go ahead and try these. Look at the configurations for these various ions. In my answers, I wrote out the full electron configurations. Feel free to write the noble gas configurations if you would like. Um, but just making sure that you are removing the correct uh, uh, electrons from these cations. And hopefully you came up with something that looks like this. Lastly today, we're just going to talk about a couple of different anomalies that appear in the periodic table. It turns out that the sublevels that are half filled also present a certain stability when ions are being formed. And so with, for instance, chromium and copper, Pull up the periodic table. Oh my goodness, I've got seven emails in the time that I've been doing this lecture. Take a peek at those in a little bit. Let's pull up this periodic table then. And so at these positions in the table, at in, in D4 and then again over here at D9, it turns out that let's shrink this down a little bit, pull up. So if we were going to look, for instance, at the configuration of copper, so we're going to come up with argon for the noble gas configuration. So we would think that it would be 4s2, 3d9. So the orbital filling would look something like this. So this is what you would assume that copper is going to look like. It turns out, however, that if instead of filling like this, and this again only happens really here in this row or in this column here with chromium on down and this column with copper on down, it turns out that it's actually more stable instead If copper instead fills 4s1, 3d10. So we get one electron here, and the d sublevel 
becomes completely filled. Now we don't have to worry about the reasons for this. All we have to know is the effect that this is going to have because now, instead of up here, we have what we would call a full sublevel and then what we would call no arrangement. It's, it's not half filled, it's not filled, it's just no arrangement versus a half filled sublevel and a full sublevel. That half filled and filled is more stable than the no arrangement above. And so the actual electron configuration for copper is going to look like this. The result of that, and what that ends up meaning when copper forms an ion, is that instead of losing, having two electrons to lose in the S sublevel, copper is only going to be able to lose one electron. And so a very typical charge that a copper ion might have is Cu1+. This happens even more drastically with silver. The only charge that a silver ion is ever going to form is just a 1+, plus because of the same anomaly that occurs. This is why we don't have to, when we're naming silver compounds, silver is a transition metal, but we don't have to say silver 1 chloride, for instance, because silver will only ever be 1 because of this weird anomaly. And so this is just something worth pointing out because you will run into some of these. You will run into some configurations of chromium, for instance, copper, silver, gold. You'll run into some of those and you need to take this into account. But it's, again, only for these sort of anomalous locations in the table. Okay, I'm actually going to stop there as far as the live lecture. Part of today's lecture, though, does also include periodic properties. I want you to look at the supplemental video on periodic properties instead of me lecturing on it. So remember where you can find that. If you go to the website under Unit 3, Unit 3 Materials, we scroll down to our supplemental videos and right here, Periodic Trends. I want you to watch this supplemental video. It's going to give you the same exact information. You're just not going to have my handsome face to look at. Um, but that will give you all the information that we need on periodic trends. But that absolutely does go along with this lecture material as well. I just wanted to sort of, this was a, a, a good breaking point and I didn't want to make the live lecture too long. And so that is it for today. A lot of information. I know this is a ton of stuff. And this is not necessarily as intuitive stuff as we've looked at even with, with our last unit. This is brand new to a lot of you, difficult, hard to conceptualize content. It is okay if you do not completely understand it at this point after the first lecture. Take some time with it. Go back and look through the textbook. Areas that were fuzzy in the text should make a little bit more sense now. Rewatch this lecture a few times if you have to. Um, it's going to take a little bit of time sitting with this stuff for it to really make sense. And remember, anyone who wants to, send me an email for what you think my new or mixed up intros should be to lecture, and you might earn yourself a few extra points on, the, on your next exam. So that being said, I hope everybody has a great day, and that's it for today. Goodbye.